Hello and welcome to Understanding Existentialism. My name is Mark Dorsby and today we'll be talking about Jean-Paul Sartre's Being and Nothingness. In particular, we're going to take a look at chapter two of that his work called Bad Faith. And really what we're going to see is that this uh, discussion uh, that Sartre has in this chapter really follows along this question, which is what happens when the negation of consciousness turns upon itself? So. To give you a quick reminder, in our previous video, or at least in the first chapter of Jean-Paul Sartre's work here on the origin of negation, Sartre gives the idea that ultimately consciousness is an, has uh, a property that we can call negation, and that is the ability to recognize nothing in the context of something. Uh, for the, the example he gave was that when you go to a restaurant and you look uh, for someone, you look for someone named Pierre, and you don't see Pierre, before you is nothing but uh, the fullness of being. You have the cafe, there's just people there. All you can see in consciousness, or at least initially, all that's there are beings that exist, and yet you're able to recognize something that is not the case. And notice that that's a fact about that cafe, even though um, it, it refers to nothingness. And so the question that Sartre unravels here in this first work is the notion that consciousness has this fundamental property. Or to put it in a larger context, if we look at intentionality as the directedness of consciousness that Husserl talks about, then we can say that negation is ultimately a fundamental property of intentionality itself. Because when I have a directedness of consciousness, I automatically am only conscious of something. But that means I'm not conscious of other things. So it's as it were, the ability to actually be conscious of something requires the ne property of consciousness as negative. And so the question then becomes, well, what happens when we negate, when the, the person who is conscious negates themselves? And ultimately, there's two sort of parts going on here. This property of negation is fundamental in Sartre's view as being the property of freedom. It's, the, it's what freedom is. That's what enables freedom to be. Freedom is when um, the what came before cannot predict what comes next, right? So the activity of consciousness cannot be predicted because of this ne negative property of negation. So anyway, so we, that's where that's what the seat of freedom is for Sartre. Um, and then he discusses the notion that ultimately we can fall into bad faith. Um, then that is where we negate our own negation. Or in other words, we deny, freedom denies itself. And that's going to be a fundamental thing. Now, we'll see in this chapter that Sartre's not going to use, he's not going to get into freedom so much. That'll actually come next uh, when he moves into the question of the for itself. And that's a fundamental background condition to keep in mind is that so far there's two, there's a critical distinction in Sartre's work between what he calls the in itself, that's being in itself, versus being for itself. And um, in the first two chapters here, he's just really focused on the in itself. And that's when we think of something exist in itself, on its own, regardless of things. But he's going to discover ultimately that this ability to have freedom through negation ultimately means that we, we um, are not just beings in themselves, but we are beings for ourselves. So the being for itself is the type of being that can be a conscious person like you or I. So this will become a really important distinction it goes through, so I thought I'd highlight some of that. So let's sort of jump in here. Um, the first thing Sartre does at the beginning of this chapter is he, quote, updates his theory of consciousness. He writes that, you know, originally when we first started this discussion, we defined consciousness as, quote, a being such that in its being, its being is in question insofar as this being implies a being other than itself. And that's quite cryptic. Um, and he's updating his sort of discussion of consciousness to say, well, consciousness is a being, the nature of which is to be conscious of the nothingness of its being. So, uh, so that's what ultimately consciousness is, at least at this point in the analysis. So one thing here is, what does all that mean? It means that consciousness arises in the world as a no. And there's all kinds of different no's we could talk about. Um, Sartre mentions a number of, I'll call them the no's of humanity. He first gives the example of the no of the slave to the slave master and the recognition of um, the attitude of no in that context. Um, and notice that 
it goes in both directions. The slave want, has the attitude of no to the slave master, and the slave master also has an attitude of no to the slave. In this section of the chapter, Sartre actually references Hegel's master-slave dialectic. So anyone who's working on that, you may be interested in reviewing his discussion here. Uh, but there's also the no of the prisoner who sees the guard that's watching them, the no in that, that context as well. And we can see that there's this attitude of no that he's describing. It really includes anyone who takes care of another person. So you can think of kindergartner and teachers here, or overseers, which is a bit dark. Um, um, but ultimately, what gets interesting is Sartre also says that the no of this consciousness becomes a part of subjectivity itself. Now, remember, in modern philosophy, right, we have a distinction between the subjective and the objective where the objective refers to the thing in themselves, but the subjective refers to the thing, the thing which perceives, right? Which is fundamentally your own, right? Um, so there's the know that becomes a part of our own awareness of ourselves. And here he offers the idea that human personality in a certain way can be understood as a form of negation, as a know. And think about it here. When we have certain sorts of personalities, those personalities are always defined by the, their limits, right? As it were, every personality has a certain sort of contour. So perhaps you know someone who's very serious, and that person doesn't joke around very often. Now you can notice here that there's a denial on that. The negation of joking around becomes a fixed part of what that human personality looks like. So we can understand even human personality as a form of negation, which is very interesting, actually. Um, he here also references the man of resentment because that's a clear attitude of no. Um, so the person who is resentful. And here, I think what it's helpful is to maybe think about the way in which this notion of resentment links back to a discussion we had much earlier with uh, Frederick Nietzsche's discussion of resentment or resentment and the notion of the development of morality. So there's an interesting subtext going on here, I think, with Nietzsche that I think is, is going on. But interestingly, he also says there's much more subtler behaviors in which we can see the no, this attitude of no in humanity. And he takes the example of irony. And for anyone who's studying literature or art or anything like this, um, irony is a huge topic. What is irony? Well, Sark gives us a really interesting definition. He says, in irony, man annihilates what he posits within one and the same act. He leads us to believe in order not to be believed, right? So think about a person who's being ironic has a double action, right? They both are affirming, but the irony is that they're also denying it simultaneously. And so there's a way in which um, irony is a function of the attitude of no. And this attitude of no is ultimately what Sartre thinks of or calls directly bad faith. So bad faith is a really interesting and important concept. And I think in the broader existential sense, which you could say is in existentialism, going back to maybe, let's say, to Heidegger, we see there's a distinction between the, um, the authentic and the inauthentic. And, and if we go you know, to Kierkegaard, there's, a there's also this similar discussion of what it means to be an authentic person. Um, and the attitude of bad faith is the opposite of authenticity. But what we're going to see what Sartre does here is Sartre recognizes that bad faith is actually a, a more central condition for us than being authentic, which, by the way, is similar to Heidegger. Remember, Heidegger has a distinction between the Vorhanden and the Zuhanden, the present at hand and the ready at hand. The present at hand for Heidegger was an authentic mode, whereas the ready at hand is inauthentic. But the ready at hand is the fundamental lived state of Dasein. In the same way, we're going to see that for Sartre, uh, human subjectivity is fundamentally characterized first and foremost as bad faith. And in fact, he's even going to argue that being sincere is a type of bad faith. So let's walk through the argument. Well, let's start off here with a, a brief quote. He says, we shall willingly grant that bad faith is a lie to oneself on the condition that we distinguish the lie, and on the distinction that, that the lie to oneself, we distinguish the lie to oneself from lying in general. So I sort of misread that quote. But basically, what is lying in general? Well, lying in general is when I say a falsehood and I know it's a falsehood, right? So the liar um, is in possession of the truth which they hide, right? 
Um, so I so you asked me what time it is, and I decide I'm going to lie to you so you could be late to your appointment, right? I know what the truth is, which means I'm in possession of the truth that I'm hiding. So interestingly enough, that means the inner disposition of the natural liar is a positive disposition. It's still aligned with the truth, ironically. It's just you know you're lying about it, right? And let's put it this way: a normal lies within what what Sartre calls the mitzine, and he's pulling this directly from Heidegger. Mitzein, right, means with being in German. And so Mitzein means the being we have with the things in the world. Remember Heidegger's uh, emphasis on being in the world? Well, Sartre here completely adopts that same view. So, so a normal lie is given within the contours of being in the world with others. Right? I have the truth. I'm hiding it from you and so forth. It doesn't mean it's a good thing to do to lie to people, but it is what people do. Now, what is lying to oneself? This is bad faith, according to Sartre. And that means, he says, it first and foremost has the appearance of the structure of falsehood. So it looks very similar because you have a case where you're lying, but in this case, you're lying to yourself about yourself, right? Bad faith implies a sort of unit of consciousness, but it's not within the mit sein. There's no being with others in the world because it's really a relationship that I have to myself. But think about this. We get into a suddenly a contradiction or a paradox because um, if I'm lying to myself, in order for a lie to be effective, a falsehood is propagated. But if a fault, but if the, but that falsehood is propagated, that falsehood is propagated because I already positively know the truth. But in order for that lie to succeed, I can't know that truth. And so you can see here it becomes paradoxical. So to lie to oneself implies that you know the truth exactly so as you can hide it from yourself. Um, but that doesn't make one a lot of sense, right? Bad faith, on the contrary, implies the essence of a single consciousness, right? It can't be binary, um, it would seem, because uh, ultimately to successfully lie to yourself, you have to believe it. But in order to maintain it as a lie, you have to not believe it. So he says, one of the things that's interesting, if we look at bad faith as a phenomenon that exists within the world, the way in which we, it, we encounter it, he calls it um, an evident phenomena. Sorry, I can't pronounce that well. Um, which exists only in and through its own differentiation. Now, for in order for well, the word um, evanescent means quickly passing out of sight. So bad faith is a phenomena that it occurs and it quickly disappears. And he says it exists through its own differentiation. The only way that uh, bad faith can exist is by differentiating consciousness itself, uh, which it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? In the sense that it looks like there's ultimately a paradox here. Now, in order to explain this, we might be inclined to go to psychology. And the type of psychology that Sartre goes here to is um, psychoanalysis, which for many of you may not know, this is the form of psych. This is the school of psychology that was developed by Sigmund Freud. Um, and it, during when Sartre was writing this, um, Freud is without doubt um, probably the greatest um, living or one of the greatest living psychologists. Um, so, so first off, the no, or well, I don't know. I can't remember which years Freud died, but it's roughly around the same time. He was still one of the most well-known psychoanalysts psychologist in Europe for sure. Now, but so he says, it, can psychology explain this? And ultimately Sartre does not think it can. So if we go back to Freud's analysis, and here's just a kind of the real loose broad strokes, Freud art articulates the idea that there's two parts of us. There's a unconscious part of us and there's a conscious part of us. So we're conscious of the world, but there's also unconscious processes which govern consciousness. And Freud developed a model, it's really a three-part model, in which he distinguished the ego from the id, um, and then later the superego. But basically the difference between the ego and the id has to do with the difference between the ego's conscious and the id is unconscious. Now, later on, there's a notion of the superego, and the superego is really the, the conscious structure. But the way Sartre seems to be talking about it, he seems to be designating the ego as being the conscious form, and the id is the unconscious form. But what's important is that the id is the drive structure. That's where all the animalistic drives that people have are, and the ego ultimately moderates um, the id ultimately through the, the development of the I in terms of society and so forth. So there's a natural tension within um, the, 
uh, there's a natural tension uh, between the id and the ego within Freud's psychoanalysis. And here's what Sartre says is, I, I can know myself only through the mediation of the other, which means that I stand in relation to my id in the position of the other. But he says the problem, though, is that psychoanalysis substitutes for the notion of bad faith the idea of a lie without a liar. Because ultimately, the id could explain bad faith because the id is forcing us to do things uh, that are different from ourselves. And so that's where the natural tension is. But you can see the id because I'm in position of, the, of being an other to my id, which is no longer ultimately to uh, provide a, uh, a um, satisfactory analysis of bad faith when we're talking at the order of being in existentialism. Now, Sartre gives this example of the defiant patient, talking about patients who refuse to, um, they refuse to take their treatment, right? Now, which is automatically sort of bizarre because if you're a patient, you should know that you're in treatment. Uh, but if you refuse your treatment, then why are you a patient, right? So Sartre says, for, he describes the defiant patient as someone who refuses to speak. They give fantastical accounts of their dreams. Sometimes they even remove themselves completely from the treatment. Now he says, it is impossible to explain the resistance as emanating from the complex with the psycho, which the psychoanalyst wishes to bring to life. In other words, Sartre thinks that if you take the model of the ego and the id, and you try to explain the resistant patient using the very model of psychoanalysis, you'll be unable to explain it. He writes, psychoanalysis has not gained anything for us um, since in order to overcome bad faith, it is established between the unconscious and the conscious an autonomous consciousness in bad faith. The very essence of the reflexive idea of hiding something from oneself implies the unity of one and the same psychic mechanism. And so at this point, really what we have is a sort of kind of total, uh, totalized account of subjectivity. Um, he says, but the problem is we're no longer on the ground of psychoanalysis. And this goes to the differentiation between ultimately um, an existential analysis of bad faith, with, uh, with, of human inauthenticity, which is an analysis of bad faith, versus a purely descriptive behavioral account. Um, now, what are some of the patterns of bad faith? Um, instead, right, Sartre says, instead, let's talk about the patterns of bad faith. Uh, he says the first example, and probably the most famous example, he gives is the woman on a date, right? And he's talking, and you can imagine here any couple on a Friday night, uh, maybe who are on a blind date or something, going to a movie theater. Um, and let's say they are enjoying each other's company, um, but it is the first date. So he gives this as an example of bad faith. He, quote, he writes, quote, she knows very well the intentions with the, which the man who is speaking to her cherishes regarding her. She knows also that it will be necessary sooner or later for her to make a decision. So you can see here, ultimately one of the questions on a first date in a romantic context is whether or not people will become intimate with each other. And in this case, Sartre says, she knows that that's what's at stake. Um, and she understands the intentions of this person that she's on a date with, but she would choose to ignore them as not a real possibility because it would effectively ruin the date to start thinking about that. Right. So, and then he starts as, well, what happens on the first approach? So the first approach is when, uh, let's say the man in some sort of way, or one of the people on the day, well, uh, in this case, the man says something. He says, I find you so attractive, right? Now, so it says, if he says this to her, she'll disarm the phrase of its sexual background in her own consciousness. In other words, notice she will negate it, right? As a possibility of being, as it being a possibility for her. Quote, he says, she refuses to apprehend the desire for what it is. She does not even give it a name. She recognizes it only to the extent that it transcends itself towards admiration, esteem, respect, and that's wholly absorbed in the more refined forms of which it produces, to the extent of no longer figuring any more as a sort of warmth of density. But then suppose he takes her hand, right? So, and, and by the way, to be clear, Sartre is not saying that this is what every date looks like. He's just giving it an example, right? So this, this guy says, I find you so attractive, and she just takes that as being, oh, that's a very nice, warm thing to say, right? But disarms the, for her, his comment as being sexual in any sort of way. And then let's suppose he takes her hand. What happens next, right? 
What will she do? He says, the aim is to postpone the moment of the decision as long as possible. That's her aim. We know what happens next. The young woman leaves her hand there, but she does not notice she is leaving it. Right. So in other words, she doesn't want to deny him, but she also doesn't want to invite that because to do so is to transcend their relationship um, as just being people who are together in a very polite, cordial setting to suddenly to being more romantic and intimate with each other. So what does she do? Does she grab his hand with you? She just leaves it there and ignores that this is the decision that she has to make, even though she is in the context of leaving it there, making a decision. So uh, Sar says, we shall say that this woman is in bad faith. Now, this is the kind of example of bad faith that Sar is talking about, right? Uh, he says, quote, she has disarmed the, ac disarmed the actions of her companion by reducing them to being only what they are. That is to existing in the mode of the in itself. Right. So she leaves her hand there and just ignores the intentions of the person who owns the hand. And in so doing, treats the uh, treats the uh, treats the, uh, the situation and his hand as well as her own as just being beings in themselves. They're just objects that just happen to be next to each other, right? And so this is an example of, of bad faith. Now, this will become really important is that the bad faith seems to revolve around a movement towards recognizing ourselves at, in the in itself. So I, when I, I seems, it looks like in order for me to be in bad faith, I treat myself in some way as an object as an object that just exists in the world instead of being an object which is existing for itself in the world. And this is forecasting the distinction between the in itself and the for itself that we'll see in the next chapters here. Now, what's the analysis? How, to start, how do we understand this description of bad faith that he's giving us? He says, what unity do we find in these various aspects, right? He says, the basic concept is the double property of the human being who is at once a facticity and a transcendence. So what is facticity and what is transcendence? So I pulled from the glossary in being in nothingness, the definition for both. Um, Sartre writes that the facticity refers to the for itself's necessary connection with the in itself, hence with the world and its own past. It allows us to say that the for itself exists. The facticity of freedom is, that, is the fact that freedoms if that freedom is not able to not be free, right? So what is facticity? I think to describe it more, I think maybe it's easier to go back to Heidegger's discussion of facticity. Facticity refers to the necessary connection I have with being a being in the world, the fact that I'm actually here, that I exist. And of course, think about your history. So I have, there's a whole bunch of um, things that occurred before me sitting here recording this video, including I had to drive here, I had to wake up in the morning, I, you know, and on and on, et cetera, right? I had breakfast, et cetera. All of these sorts of parts are on, have a necessary connection in the stream of my life. And that's a factual claim. So my existence is precisely linked to this facticity. Now, transcendence, by contrast, means to go beyond. So transcendence refers to the process whereby the for itself goes beyond the given in a further project of itself. So Sartre's view here is that uh, there's the facticity of what I am, my given history, but I can always, as it were, through I can negate that own history and transcend into something new. I can be something new. I can have new projects for who and what I am. So, and think here about the stream of your past. And in many ways, I think this is linked to a question of ultimately time. But you have a past which seems to be flowing you in a concrete, uh, a concrete specific direction. But you also have this facticity, uh, I'm sorry, that's facticity. So you have this facticity in which you're flowing to this uh, given uh, future, but you can also transcend it and alter it and change it. And that happens through a consciousness of your own freedom. So, so ultimately what Sartre wants to say is that to better understand this distinction of bad faith or this problem of bad faith, we have to recognize this distinction between facticity and transcendence. Sartre writes, bad faith does not uh, wish to either coordinate with them or to surmount them in a synthesis. Right, so that means that bad faith is a, a case where we keep the facticity of our lives and the transcendence 
of, of consciousness, both in operation, but separate, so they don't become synthesized. So I reckon, so the, in this case, the woman, the facticity is that she's just on a nice uh, date with this person, but it's not a sexual situation. But transcend, the transcendence is to transcend that and ultimately be in a romantic relationship potentially, but she's in bad faith because she won't unify those two, right? She keeps them separated. So bad faith seeks to affirm an identity while preserving difference. So the ambiguity that's necessary for bad faith comes from the fact that I affirm here that I am my transcendence in the mode of being a thing, right? So, um, so I think that's really critical. So what does this mean? It means that what bad faith does is it characterizes human being as being in itself. We characterize ourselves and we treat ourselves as objects. Sartre writes, we have, we have seen also the use which our young lady made of our being in the midst of the world, i.e. of our inert presence as a passive object among other objects in order to relieve herself suddenly from the functions of her being in the world. So effectively, it looks like what bad faith is, is bad faith is a, a, a case in which my facticity and transcendence, two parts of my consciousness, are not brought into unity. And, and, they, and that's done because I treat myself as an object in the world um, that can't change effectively. So, okay, this is human reality ultimately we're talking about because we're all doing this. So we have to be clear, he's not just talking about the person on a date who can't um, take it seriously. He's talking about all of us in many different modes. He says we have to deal with human reality as a being which is what is not and which is not what it is. So human reality is this sort of oscillation or it includes this sort of oscillation. Now, what about sin sincerity? Like, because obviously the opposite of being in bad faith is to be sincere. But what is being sincere? Well, sincere means being what you are, right? It means being who you really are, as it were, right? But Sartre says sincerity has a similar duality. He says actual sincerity presents itself as a demand and consequently is not a state. Now, this is really important because he seems to be identifying that when we talk about sincerity in the most true sense, what it is is a demand for how we ought to live. It's not actually a state. It's not actually a form of being. But we'll see that when we think of sincerity as a form of being, it's actually a form of bad faith. He says, what then is sincerity except precisely as a phenomenon of bad faith? Have we not shown indeed that in bad faith, human reality is constituted as a being which is what is not and which is not what it is? So here's some examples. He gives the example of a waiter in a cafe, really who's not sincere. He says the waiter is in the cafe, but acts like a waiter. Um, and, the, and the waiter, his movements are too robotic, too refined, too perfect. You've probably seen the example, right? And this is a case in which you might say the waiter needs to be sincere, <laughs> right? So he gives that description, for instance. Another description he gives here, and these are cases where it doesn't look like we have sincerity, but we would beg for, for sincerity. Another example, which I think is even more interesting, is he, he is really brief, but he mentions an actor playing Hamlet, for instance, uh, also is in his form of bad faith, but we want them to be sincere, which I think is very interesting. Because you can think of, an, what does an actor do? An actor is treating themselves as something that they know they are not, right? Um, so that is bad faith, right? And also notice that the best actors are the most, the actors who can play their characters with the most sincerity, right? But what exactly does that mean? But the, the example that Sartre really fixates on is he gives the example of someone who's gay. He says the homosexual and his friendly critic. So, and this is a case where, and you gotta keep the, uh, think about the context in which Sartre is writing this. It's a much less open society. Uh, but Sartre gives the example of a person who's essentially hiding the fact that they're gay. So let's say this is the closeted homosexual. And he said the person who doesn't want to admit to anyone that they're gay, even though they are, and they have sex with men or whatnot, right? So he says, he, he gives this quote, he says, his case is always different, peculiar. There enters into it something of a game, a chance of bad luck. They're explained by a concerted conception of the beautiful which women cannot satisfy. He refuses to draw from them the conclusions which they impose. So basically he's saying 
this person who's in bad faith is, you know, has homosexual relations with people, but won't admit it to themselves, right? So, but there's always a game where they can sort of explain why they've done one thing or another, why one of one relationship has occurred and another hasn't and so forth. He says, but his friend, this person's friend, who is his most severe critic, becomes irritated with this duplicity. Quote, the critic asked the man then to be what he is, he is in order to no longer to be what he is. The critic demands of the guilty one that he constitute himself as a thing, precisely in order no longer to treat him as a thing. And this contradiction is constitutive of the demand of sincerity. So it's interesting here. Sark gives the example. He says, so this person's in bad faith, but the critic wants them to be sincere, right? The critic says, listen, you are gay. Why don't you admit that you're gay? Now, notice that in order to do that, because the this person is is living in bad faith, they're asking them to do something, it is to, to become something that they aren't yet, um, because they are. And so you, it's a contradiction, ultimately, at the bottom of it. But but here's the thing, is that the demand for um, the, the gay guy to be honest, the demand for it is based upon its own sort of contradiction. So ultimately what Sartre wants to say is that sincerity really is a form of bad faith. He writes, the champion of sincerity is in bad faith to the degree that in order to reassure himself, he pretends to judge to the extent that he demands that freedom as freedom constitute itself as a thing, right? Because the demand is you have to admit that you are a quote homosexual, which means is to make yourself, your freedom, a thing. But notice to make yourself a thing is not to be free. So the demand for sincerity ultimately is a form of bad faith. He writes, thus the essential structure of sincerity does not differ from that of bad faith since the sincere man constitutes himself as what he is in order not to be it. Total constant sincerity as a constant effort to adhere to oneself is by nature a constant effort to disassociate oneself from oneself. A person frees himself from himself by the very act by which he makes himself an object for himself. So, and think about here just a quick thing, uh, quick set of reflections on sincerity. When I try to be sincere, that presumes that I'm not sincere, right? Which means that while I am sincere, I'm no longer truly the thing that I am. Um, and so you can see here, that's really just the negative, that's just the inverse form of bad faith. And so you can see here, Sartre's notion of bad faith is deeper than just um, about our emotional concepts. It really goes back here to the fundamental stru ontological structure that has to be at the basis of these things. Now, what is the goal of bad faith? The goal of bad faith is to put oneself out of reach. It's an escape, right? And what is it an escape from? Ultimately, it's an escape from our own freedom. Now, it's like a game of mirrors. Bad faith is possible only because sincerity is conscious of missing its goal inevitably due to its very nature. So we know that if you're trying to be sincere, you'll never really succeed in the end, right? The most sincere person doesn't have to be sincere. So bad faith attempts to constitute myself as a being what as being what I am not. So in order to better understand uh, bad faith, maybe we need to go backwards and we need to talk a little bit about what the faith of bad faith refers to. What does it mean to have faith, right? Sartre says that the true problem of bad faith stems evidently from the fact that bad faith is in fact a, for a form of faith. And what is faith? Faith is belief, right? That's what faith is. It's the, the belief in something. Now, the essential problem of bad faith is the problem of belief, according to Sartre. So with bad faith, a truth appears, right? There, a sort of truth appears, and there's a method of thinking, a type of being, which is like that of objects, right? So we notice that it, bad faith, in order to keep the transcendent and the facticity apart, right, treats the person, we treat ourselves, or at least one dimension of ourselves, as just being an object, so consequent in that we so we we have faith in ourselves as being objects. So consequently, a peculiar type of evidence appears, which is non-persuasive evidence. He says 
in that is the person who's in bad faith has all sorts of different reasons to maintain themselves as objects to deny the, their own freedom to deny themselves as being free um, and they have all sorts of reasons to do so but those reasons don't link up because they're not objects so it's non-persuasive evidence which is persuasive um, so you can see here at the core of bad faith is this sort of structure of contradictory now um, he says quote but the nature of consciousness is such that in it the immediate and the immediate are one and the same being to believe is to know that one believes and to know that one believes is no longer to believe so think about that if i say i believe something if i have to tell myself i believe x that presupposes that i don't actually believe x and i have to somehow make a movement towards it so the notion of the media is what happens um, over time through different iterations of um, episodes of life or whatever and the immediate is what's happening at the, at the exact moment right so to say i believe something is as it were um, the consciousness tries to combine the immediate with the immediate so that we know who we are while we're living right uh, but to tell myself that i have to believe it means that in the immediate i don't believe it right so the idea of good faith that is to believe what one believes is like that of sincerity, to be what one is, an idea of being in itself. And what Sartre wants to do here is say that, listen, bad faith is maybe, as it were, the more fundamental structure because faith itself, to believe myself as being something, presupposes that I'm not that thing. And that is, as it were, the same structure of bad faith. Good faith wishes to flee the not believing what one believes by finding refuge in being. Bad faith flees by, be, by taking refuge in not believing what one believes. So good faith seeks to flee the inner disintegration of my being in the direction of the in itself, which it should be and is not. And bad faith seeks to flee the in itself by means of the inner disintegration of my being. But it denies this very disintegration as it denies that it is itself bad faith. So you can see here is that ultimately faith and bad faith have parallel structures. If bad faith is possible, it's because it is an immediate, permanent threat to every project of the human being. It's because consciousness conceals in its being that there's a permanent risk of bad faith. So ultimately, Sartre wants to say, I think that the kind of takeaway here is that Sartre thinks that bad faith is a fundamental condition in consciousness. Um, and it is characterized when consciousness becomes uh, consciousness becomes dual, a dual dualized or a, a duality between facticity and transcendence, uh, between the immediate and the immediate, but it refuses a synthesis, um, and that that's a fundamental structure. So the denial, the freedom, free we are so free, let's say, that we have the freedom to deny our own freedom. And this is a fundamental characteristic of who we are as beings. So this is basically the discussion. Now, the final thing I mentioned here is that all of it revolves around ultimately treating ourselves in some manner as being objects in themselves, as an object in itself. I'm X, I'm Y. But we're going to see, Sartre now is going to say, well, in order to think beyond bad faith here, in order to maybe resurrect or to capture some sort of sense of authenticity, we're going to have to introduce a different characterization of being. And we're going to see instead of it being a being in itself, we're actually beings for ourselves. Okay. In our next video, we're going to conclude our discussion with Sartre by taking a look at some of these varied concepts. So thank you guys very much for watching, and I will see you guys online.